started with a TED talk. I watched the 15 very concise minutes about how one little word can potentially influence our economy, our politics, and ultimately our entire social systems. And that little word was blockchain, and I was hooked. Technology and politics used to be very separate domains, but that is clearly no longer the case. The line between where blockchain ends and society begins is comparable to if someone had created an app which can make music, and it was later discovered that the same app, if used differently, has the potential for communication with aliens. The beauty of new technology and why I'm so fascinated by it is that anyone can make something happen, create and launch it without needing permission from some higher power or needing any fancy tools or spaces to work in. In the case of blockchain, this someone was an anonymous cryptographer who in 2008 sent the code of Bitcoin to a friend, launching the first ever peer-to-peer, -peer, economically logical, self-sustainable, and open form of digital cash, the foundations of blockchain. The definition of blockchain, Marion Webster defines blockchain as a digital database containing information such as transactions, financial transactions, that can be simultaneously used and shared with a large decentralized publicly accessible network. This does not mean that the centralized is that each piece of information is split into smaller pieces and shared all over, but rather that a copy of everything that happens is shared with everyone on the network. This allows for things to not only be extremely transparent, but also really safe and secure. And it's through this combination of safety and transparency that blockchain allows for the elimination of the middleman. Banks, courts, or any of the institutions that we rely on for handling the lack of trust we have when dealing with strangers. But it wasn't actually until 2014 that the underlying technology of Bitcoin, blockchain, was discovered and this mainly by the banks. Since then, a broad range of industries have dipped their toes from storing music and pictures to, on a blockchain to decentralized energy grids. But so far, not a lot is known on a more general level about the technology. And why should we want to know about it? Well, beyond it being a story of fascinating development, it's also the story of how new technology gets hyped and what that hype brings with it, both good and bad. As it is currently, blockchain is still thought of as an infrastructure, challenging the entire way that operations are run, which requires both the technology providers and the people using the technology to be able to understand if it has any potential benefits, to be able to know if it's worth it. The Gartner hype cycle is a graph that shows the trajectory of most emergent technologies on a hype avenue. And it looks like this. You have hype, and you have time, and then you have a curve that goes like this. And blockchain is somewhere around here at the moment, just emerging from the peak of the hype, meaning it's being looked at with more critical eyes. Blockchain, as any new technology, has undergone several stages of attention, from anarchists believing it to rattle the financial sector, to associations with criminal activity. And in roughly the past four years, it has gained buzzword status when it comes to solving all of our problems. But despite this hype, a uh, current lack of scalability and the complex nature of the technology obscures understandings for organizations which could truly benefit from adoption. The actual benefits get drowned in a pool of fragmented opinion. Blockchain is in dire need of a review. And that's exactly what I set out to do when I started researching for my master's thesis in early 2019. I, um, I have quite literally been able to read through all the most relevant research and information on the topic of blockchain for social good since the conception of Bitcoin which was in 2008. I was inspired to take a more critical stance from its use in humanitarian aid, and I wanted to look into how to best implement the technology for social impact work. But looking into best practice, I realized that there was no framework, there was no roadmap for how to best use the technology. 
By far the most existent examples came from the realm of for-profit business, and within that, by far, were from the, most were from the financial sector. Um, one case of non-financial implementation with high social impact is land ownership, land right registration. Here it might not be useful to talk about blockchain or no blockchain, but rather which level of blockchain integration a system has. A case I also used for my own research were the land registry efforts in Ghana. In Ghana, as in many countries riddled with corruption, it can be hard to prove ownership of land, which means that people sometimes have to do things like this. People literally run the risk of someone else putting their house up for sale because these others have bribed authorities to say that it's now theirs. An American Ghanaian initiative started a collaboration with the state of Ghana and related banks to put land, right, land transactions on a blockchain. The land or house is geometrically recorded and attached to a unique serial number. The real estate transactions happen on a closed network of known computers, but the processing happens on a public blockchain network, allowing anyone to verify it. Sensitive information remains encrypted, but access can be granted for legal purposes. This then lays the foundations for lawful negotiation in court. The land slash homeowner receives a passcode proving their ownership, and this without knowing that it's happening through blockchain whatsoever. On a blockchain complexity scale, um, uh, if we have 10 here and zero here, it's somewhere around here. Um, not very complex. All successful blockchain projects are unnoticed. This is a case where blockchain can do really good social impact, but unfortunately, single cases are not enough. We need a framework. In order for, uh, to demonstrate the effect of blockchain for an NGO, NPO, or the like, they need to have some sort of framework to follow. And I had been in the space for more than two years when I started researching for my master's thesis, and I had heard the technology be described in so many different ways that I had lost track of what it could really do. So what I decided to do was to use a framework called PESTLE, commonly used in business to assess the potential success of a new product or service, in order to assess the landscape around the technology. This way, I was quieting the loud voices in the blockchain space in order to see what the rest of the world had to say. It gave me a 360-degree view of the current situation and allowed me to look at things from a more broader perspective rather than just the classic financial economic perspective. And here are some things that I found. I found that the mantra, more decentralization is better, completely neglects the facet of governance. The more decentralized units you have, the more autonomous each becomes and the more governance each actually needs. Something which can be really difficult to tackle for an NGO which often lacks the technical know-how to set up and upkeep a new global IT infrastructure. Something else that I found was that most of these projects were actually private and permissioned, meaning they're a closed network of interaction, much like a usual database. This is not exactly very decentralized. And it also says a lot about the maturity of the technology, that NGOs, NPOs, and the like are not too happy putting their data onto systems that they can't oversee. It also says something about how the technology is developing. As for blockchain, most of the monetary value is stored in the protocol layer and not in the application, which is kind of the opposite of how the internet works, where most of the monetary value is stored in the application. This means that for blockchain, most of investment has been flowing into creating more foundational systems rather than user-centric apps. And what good is a technology if it's not widely used? On a topic of overcrowding with new foundational systems, I uh, entered the field exactly during the boom of cryptocurrencies, as you might remember when people discover that they can do their own crowdfunding for doing their own coins and own closed systems for using these coins. Back in 2017, there were 1,300 coins on CoinMarketCap, of which only 300 have survived. This says a lot about 
the thought that people put into making these coins, and the consequences, of which time seems to be the only judge. The conversation around blockchain followed a similar trajectory to cryptocurrencies, as banks started hyping the technology back in 2014, and then it became a story of pure fear of missing out. And here's that fear of missing out as I've experienced it. Normal solution finding process goes, what's the problem? What kind of solution is needed? What tool should we use? FOMO solution finding process goes, we want to do something with blockchain. What can we do with blockchain? Here's a problem that seems like we can apply blockchain to it. <laughs> yeah. Beyond the fact that the technology is then not spreading into the normal masses, this overflow of new systems has also led to that the applications that do um, are created cannot communicate with each other. This technology that was created in the spirit of accessibility to all is now being appropriated by big banks, big tech, and big business. And in that process, inclusion has slowly been swept aside while we weren't looking. Or perhaps while we were just trying to sound hip, using all the blockchain buzzwords. Instead of um, asking people to come and collaborate, we're busy sounding hip, and we're creating this closed in crowd, this exclusive tech cast system that we really want to be in on because we're so aware of the danger of being on the outside of this particular story. Isn't it, however, more damaging to keep everyone else out? It's because of this last point that my co-founders and I founded uh, Crypto Women Copenhagen. We saw a twofold problem. He was a field with huge potential and too few women, and it was hard to navigate the field for anyone. Without being too political about it, we wanted to create a space where women who were curious could come forward, ask questions, learn and engage with blockchain. And the mix was great, both in terms of age, educational background, and level of understanding. Our job was to include and communicate. I have a friend who teaches programming, and she always says, the best way to learn, is the best way to become skillful is to teach. And damn, did I learn a lot. <laughs> we advised masters, theses, journalists, and even the United Nations. The fact that all three of us founders came from social science backgrounds helped us maintain a more critical perspective. And it seemed like the more humanistic sectors, such as academia, journalism, and the humanitarian, had been needing it. In his book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, author Yuval Noah Harari says, philosophers are very patient people, but engineers are far less patient, and investors are the least patient of all. This idea stuck with me because I've been on a journey from the end of social science into the startup world, into business school, and into the tech space. And on my journey, I have experienced the radically different ways in which these worlds think, relate to money, make decisions, and approach human values. I experienced the speeding up of decision-making and the narrowing of contemplation. At first, it felt liberating and energizing. But after a while, it had me question my values in the process. For me, entering the blockchain space was a way to express my values again, as the space, the newness of the space made it open to critique. My story of working with blockchain takes place at the convergence of a wish to help, technical curiosity, and a business mindset. It's also the story of how new technology teaches us to look at old problems with new eyes or even things that we didn't believe to be problems in the first place. Like, for example, how inclusive tech culture really is. After all, the whole idea of blockchain was not only to decentralize, but also to democratize technology. And as it is right now, only very few organizations use it in a way that is true to its initial purpose. So, who is responsible for fostering technological inclusion? Well, it's hard to say, as this field, uh, unlike how the internet was developed by a few people in one place, is developing at such a speed and in so many different places at once that it's hard to create a framework around it. But the first thing we can do is step up, and that goes for all of us. So here's what we can do. Number one, question it. 
Look at what part of operations a company or organization is using blockchain for, and let that guide you to whether or not it's a good project. Are they using it to truly become more transparent in that they're showing parts of themselves to the outside world or other organizations? Or are they more using it as a gimmick to make customers and stakeholders believe that they're being innovative? Then, question it again, number two. If the words trust, transparency, immutability, decentralization are to mean anything, one question to ask is whether blockchain is truly better than other systems available when it comes to trust, transparency, immutability, and decentralization. Finally, question it again. If you work with blockchain in any way, contribute to true open source and contribute your skills and your enthusiasm to organizations which try to promote actual adoption of the technology and not just another cool techie solution. Again, what good is a technology without its users? If you work in big tech, don't spend all your time promoting your own company, but leave some energy for the rest of the ecosystem too, and invite as many and as diverse people in, techies and non-techies alike. Generally speaking, instead of trying to understand how blockchain works, what is more important for an inclusive culture is that we look into who's using the technology and for what purpose. After all, most people don't really care how a car engine works. They just want to drive, right? So ultimately, the story of blockchain is the story of all new technology. It teaches us to look at things anew, and the future of, of blockchain for social impact will depend on uh, how inclusive the culture will become. It's an evolution, not a revolution, and uh, I invite you all to explore it. Thank you.